Good evening, everyone. I'm Christine Pulliam, and I want to welcome you to the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics Observatory Night. Tonight, we will travel into the future to get a look at astronomy in the year 2020. So I want you all to power up your flux capacitors, <laughs> buckle into your DeLoreans, and get ready for a wild ride. But our journey does not start in a mall parking lot it begins on a mountaintop. You see, the future of science relies on bigger facilities and better instruments. For example, the discovery of the Higgs boson depended entirely on the construction of the Large Hadron Collider in Europe, which is the world's biggest particle accelerator. It is a gigantic ring 17 miles in circumference. And it has equally impressive experiments within it just one of the experiments is 150 feet long, sorry, yeah, 150 feet long, 80 feet across, and it weighs 7,000 tons. These are the scale of the instruments that we have to build to do cutting edge science. But bigger is better in astronomy, too. We are always wanting to build bigger telescopes, but not necessarily for the reason that everybody first thinks. It is not that bigger telescopes give you more magnification. It's because bigger telescopes collect more light. You can think of a telescope as a big light bucket. And so the bigger your bucket, the more photons of light that you can collect. And that means that you can see things that are fainter and farther away and study them in more detail. So the progress of astronomy has always depended on having the biggest telescopes that you could make. In 1847, right here at Harvard University, the Great Refractor began being used for observations. It was the biggest telescope at the time with a huge 15-inch lens, which doesn't sound too big nowadays, but it was the biggest at the time. And with that telescope, astronomers were able to discover Saturn's C-ring and Saturn's eighth moon, Hyperion, for example. Then, in 1923, Edwin Hubble got to use the newly constructed or recently constructed 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson Observatory. Again, at the time, 100 inches was the world's largest. And with that telescope, Hubble was able to detect a special kind of variable star in Andromeda. And by studying that star and others like it, he saw that Andromeda was not a nebula within our own galaxy. It was a galaxy in its own right. Now. We are looking ahead to the year 2020 and the giant Magellan Telescope. This is going to be a monster. It is going to unite seven mirrors together to form an effective aperture of 80 feet across. And the, yes, 80 feet. <laughs> and the first light instrument, GCLEF, is going to be designed to study Earth-like planets, potentially Earth-like planets, around nearby stars. So there is no telling what this telescope is going to discover. Now tonight's speaker, Jeff McClintock, is a senior astrophysicist here at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. His focus is the study of stellar mass black holes in X-ray binary systems. Since the mid-1980s, he and his colleagues have been measuring the masses of these black holes and observing them closely at X-ray, optical, and radio wavelengths. During the past decade, he has played a leading role in measuring the spins of these same black holes, some of which can speed at, spin at close to the speed of light. And from 2009 to 2013, he served as a member of the board of directors of the Giant Magellan Telescope. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Jeff McClintock. Thanks, Christine. Um, I'm a Smithsonian scientist. I work here at the Center for Astrophysics, and uh, my specialty is black holes. But I've worked quite a bit on helping to build this telescope for the five years that I was on the board of directors. And this telescope is a, uh, has these seven big mirrors. There's also a picture of it here. It will be up all the time. And then it has seven little mirrors here. And what happens is the light comes in from a very distant object, say a quasar, a billion light years away. And it comes in, and it 
hits these very large mirrors that collect as much light as possible, this 80-foot diameter aperture, and then each of these mirrors reflects back up into a little mirror up here, a secondary mirror at the top. And then the light goes back down through the hole in this central mirror here, and it goes down into instruments. The telescope itself, it's really, really not much more than like a lens. It just collects the light and focuses it. And it's the instruments down inside here that analyze the light and produce all these results. So um, this is this is I call that one. I call this, by the way, my fourth telescope. This was my third telescope here. This is a pre-Sputnik picture <laughs> of me with my uh, my telescope, and uh, uh, this was a science project. And the most interesting thing about this science project is so there was at a science fair. And I had a dish of mercury here on a record turntable. <laughs> and there were about five pounds of mercury in this pie dish. And there were hundreds of people walking around at this science fair. That's not today. <laughs> <laughs> but I, anyway, that's my third telescope. This is my fourth. Not my fourth. This is 10,000 people's fourth. I, there was a lot of people working on this. But my first telescope was one of the most fun things in my life. So I wanted to just tell you about it. I was, I was about 11 years old. And I saw an ad in Popular Mechanics one of these really small postage stamp ads, and it said, get a 100 power telescope, $1. So I had $1, and I sent it in, and they sent me, uh, in a little box, they sent me two lenses and a little sheet with instructions, and the instructions said, you know, take the two lenses and hold them eight feet apart. <laughs> one of them had a 100-inch focal length, the other had a one-inch focal length. You hold them 100, and so, you know, yeah, yeah, so I got a big tube that you roll linoleum flooring on, and I stuck the lenses in the end of it, and I, you know, jimmied it around. I looked at the moon, it was, it was incredible. But, but the, really, the first test I did was I looked across the bay. We lived in Sinclair, not in Puget Sound. I looked across the bay, and I could see this sign that we see all the time when we drove by to go to Bremerton from our, town, from our little town. And we would drive by, and we see the sign. And I could see it all the way across the bay a mile, and I could read it. And I could read it, and that was really impressive to me. But I sort of expected it, 100 power. Because I'd look through binoculars, you know, and there's seven power. So I had an idea, 100 power should, so I could read it. But you know what? The sign was upside down. And I didn't understand it. I didn't understand it. Two lenses turns it upside down. But my, my grandfather's binoculars were right side, so I didn't get it. I just didn't get it. And, and so I remember, I can remember this distinctly, taking the tube that was sitting there on this rocking chair and was going looking through this plate glass window and rotating it. Just, <laughs> But this is what you do when you're desperate and you don't understand. So, the, so telescopes have been incredibly important. And no telescope perhaps more important than this one. This is Galileo, you know, 1610 or so, looking at Jupiter. And he sees his satellites that are now the Galilean satellites. And he sees them orbiting Jupiter in a flash. You know, he already knew, but in a flash here, this confirmed beyond any doubt that Copernicus was right, you know, that the Earth went around the sun rather than the other way around. Here was a whole world system happening right there. He saw it, and you know, that shocked everyone. And, and telescopes over time, there's so many discoveries, I'm not going to go through them. Uh, Christine mentioned one, actually, namely, you know, Hubble looking out, and Messier had seen all these little smudgy objects, and they, a lot of people thought they were in the galaxy. But Hubble looked and he found one, and he was able, through a particular technique, to find its distance, and he found it. It was way out beyond our Milky Way. It was an island universe, another galaxy out there. And imagine how that changed things. Now it's not just our galaxy. And then, and then he also got the redshift. You know, the further away a galaxy is, the faster away it's moving from us. That's why he's really so famous. That's why the Hubble Space Telescope is called the Hubble Space Telescope. And today, we know of 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. 100 billion galaxies. It's, it's astonishing, really. And that's about all there are, because you can only see out so far. And then there's a, there's a limit to how far you can see, because at some point, space is expanding at the speed of light, and you can't see beyond that. So you, we only have 100 billion, so I hope you know, that's enough. <laughs> so, but 100 billion galaxies, and we can look back to that last I mean, I'll, I'll show you a slide later, but the surface of Alaska, we, we can see back to clearly to where the universe was only 400,000 years old, and presently it's 13.7 billion years old. 
So we see it almost in its infancy, looking back all that way in time. So this is where we are, and this is where telescopes have taken us, and it's really quite astonishing. Now, what I'm going to show you in this next slide, I did not think I would see in my lifetime. And it's sort of an analog, an analog of this. It's not this, but it's an analog of this. Namely, here is a picture. As I say, I didn't think not only that my son would even see this in, in his lifetime. Here is a picture of four planets, A, B, C, D, in case you can't see them. They're, they're circled, they're, they're not really circled on the sky, but A, B, C, D, and right here is a star. I mean, this guy here, Andy Skamer, is the one who took the picture. He's down at the University of Arizona. This, this picture of these planets orbiting the star is just a direct picture with one of these eight meter mirrors at the Large Binocular Telescope in Arizona. So you take a picture and you can see those stars, but you know what? It's not that easy. Think about it. Like if you were way far away and you wanted to take a picture of Earth and Jupiter and the sun would be a billion times brighter than the planets. So he's done some trick here. That's why he's smiling. There's, he's done some <laughs> trick to crunch that star down so you can see them. Nevertheless, this is a tour de force and it uses what I'm going to show you later are magic mirrors. They can't be magic. Of course, they wouldn't be useful. But they are as close to magic, in my opinion, as you get, okay? <laughs> and so with these special mirrors, and on a telescope with one eight-meter mirror and one of these very special mirrors, this is one of these little ones up here, he was able to take this picture, and this whole picture is only one arc second on the sky. Now, I don't, you all don't have a good feel for arc seconds, so I'm going to give you some feel for it. So uh, the, the, say the full moon is 2,000 arc seconds across. It's about a half a degree. So you get a feel of that. But a better feel is if I take one of these, precious. these precious hairs here, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, I, and I hold it out. Like, and a hair is about the smallest thing you can see with your eye. It's about a tenth of a millimeter across. And I hold it out, not three feet, but let's just imagine that my arm was really long, and I could reel it out 70 feet away. 70 feet away, this human hair, if I put that hair and I put it in the way of this, it would cover this completely, one arc second. A hair at 70 feet covers this field. So that's how small, and to do this then, what you need are, which I'll show you, these magic mirrors that allow you to get this incredible spatial resolution that you can see these planets up next to this star. It's really astonishing. So this is only one arc second across this whole field, one human hair at 70 feet. Today, we know of uh, hundreds of planets, or even more, from the Kepler satellite and so forth. And, and here's representations of, say, four classes of planets. Of course, the ones that excite us intensely are the ones that kind of look like ours, <laughs> because we imagine that they've got what it takes you know, in the habitable zone and the right kind of is everything, water and so on. So this, there's, the search for Earths is huge, or near Earths. And then there's the roasters. These are planets bigger than Jupiter, but they're in closer than Mercury, so they get really hot. And this is Heather Knudsen. She was a PhD here. She's now at Caltech, too. And she's the queen of the roasters. And here's the, <laughs> here, here's the water worlds down here. Jacob Bean from the University of Chicago. Planets that are just covered by water. And so he's the sort of the king of those. And here's the ice giants and so forth. So there's planets of all kinds. Now, how do, they, how do you detect planets? Well, I've already shown you one way. When you're really lucky and you've got the greatest telescopes, then you can just take a picture of those planets. But, and you know, I should have made a point a moment ago because it's, it's a very good point. I'm going to go back one. You know, the GMT is going to be three times, have three times sharper images in this. So we'll see lots more systems with these planets like this. But the important thing with the GMT, and as a point Christine made, we have seven mirrors, and we can take spectra. That means disperse the light out, and we can look for little signs of chlorophyll or ozone or oxygen. We have a chance to actually look for signs of life by having this huge collecting area, which is what it takes to be able to examine the light well. I mean, this is just a picture, but you want to take that light and break it into a rainbow and study the rainbow of that light. In any case, one way is to find planets is just take a picture. Okay, that's what Andy Schamer did. The, another way is, yeah, here it is, is what 
Christine was mentioning, and that is you have a sun, say this is our sun, and you have a planet go in front of it like this. And when the planet goes in front, it dims the light of the sun. Just a little bit. This looks like it would dim it a lot, but this is out of scale. In fact, I don't have one with me, that's funny. I should have, right here in my hand, a peppercorn about a millimeter in size. That's the relative size of the Earth and the sun, a one millimeter peppercorn and this. So when the Earth goes in front of the sun, the dimming is, the Earth's about 10,000 miles, it's about a million miles, so the area is like 10 to the fourth, 10,000. So the light only goes down a hundredth of a percent, so it's just a tiny little bit as this little black dot goes out across the sun. And that's what you look for when you look for planets and you're just looking at the light and you see it dim ever so often. For those planets that are just in the planes, you wouldn't get it for a planet like this. It's gotta be a planet that's passing in front of the star. That's the transit technique. That's how the Kepler satellite works. And the third way to find planets, I'm gonna tell you at the end. <laughs> so, um, I just wanna see if I can get some water. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so I wanna tell you about, so what I'm doing now is I'm talking to you about some science that's, that's exciting to me, that's related to this telescope. And, and Another science topic, in fact, the science topic that's in really interesting to me, are black holes. And black holes are the biggest mystery that presently exists in the physical sciences, in physics. It is quite unknown how vast quantities of matter, you know, billion solar systems, or a million, a billion, or whatever, can be crushed to a point by gravity, completely out of existence. It is completely unknown, and if you think Stephen Hawking knows, forget it. <laughs> Nobody knows. We do, not have, we do not have that theory of quantum gravity, which is the theory that the string theorists keep working for the last 30 years, 10,000 of them or something, and nobody's come up with it. So obviously we need you know, some real breakthrough in understanding, but that breakthrough will be a very great one, and it may be the ultimate one in, phys in physics. It may be that theory of everything you probably heard about in movies or something. Um, in any case, there's two classes of black holes. There's, there's the kind that I study, which are stars that have spent their life and just their, their heat is gone, and they, they are crushed by gravity in a very short time. And so how much time have I got here? Oh, yeah, I'm doing good. I, I was looking at the wrong thing. I'm not used to this. Um, so the, 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 when a star is burned out its fuel, a very massive star, then there's no more pressure force inside. It's like, like a hot air balloon. You turn it off and you just fall to the ground. It, just, it collapses in a fraction of a second. The core crush, crunches down on the star, and, and, and if it's massive enough, it'll just collapse all the way past a neutron star into a black hole, into a point. And there's tens of millions of those kinds of black holes in our galaxy. And they typically weigh about 10 times the mass of the sun. That's one class. The other class are the ones that are in the centers of galaxies. There's one in the center of each galaxy. And they're millions to billions times the mass of the sun. So they're really, really massive. And our galaxy has one. And this galaxy has one, too. So here is a black hole whose mass has been measured, measured to be two billion sun masses, okay? Two billion times the mass of the sun crushed to a point, and of course you don't see the point. All this light around it is, you know, hot gas. And what you see are these jets coming out. Do you see this jet? And do you see this counter jet here? These jets are very powerful. They're particles firing out in a very fine beam, only a degree or so wide, carrying particles at essentially the speed of light more than 98% the speed of light. And these particles carry vast energy, and that energy goes, and by the way, the whole size of this is about the size of our Milky Way, a couple hundred thousand light years. So this is a very big thing. This is a big galaxy, and this is a radio picture. It's made in radio waves, and in this radio waves, you can see the jet. And this jet is enormously powerful. The amount of energy, this is called Cygnus A, this is a particular system, and the energy in these lobes the energy in these lobes is, okay, just let me think now, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the 6, yes, 10 to the 9th. It's a billion times, 1 billion times 
the energy that our sun will radiate over its entire 10 billion year lifetime. One billion times that is being shot out. Yes. And you'd say, well, what's a black hole doing that for? Because you've always heard that it just collects stuff. Everything goes in. But think about it. Its gravity is immense. For the black holes I study, matter is accelerated at essentially a trillion G as it gets close to the event horizon. Now, you've all seen movies of you know, these pilots and stuff, you know, when they're pulling Gs and they're in a corner or something in there. You know, <laughs> so that's, you know, 10 Gs or something. And you know what a G is. It's holding in your chair. And if you fall off a ladder, you know what it means. And the, and the point is, this is a trillion Gs. So it's kind of hard to imagine. So what happens is matter falls toward these things. And it comes crashing violently together there. And some extra matter gets squirted out in these jets along the rotation axis of the black hole. So I'm going to tell you something now that not that many people know. A black hole, this isn't a black hole, but <laughs> a black hole can be completely described by just two numbers. Two numbers. This is very profound, actually. It's called a black, it's called a no-hair theorem. Ball. <laughs> they have no features. Only two numbers completely define a black hole. How much it weighs, that's its mass. I told you this one's two billion sun masses. And the other number is how fast it's spinning how fast it's rotating, those two numbers. And you know the fastest black holes we measure uh, typically are spinning at uh, about 40,000 RPM, about the speed of an ultra centrifuge, the fastest ones. So they're spinning very fast. You might ask me what it means to spin. I might tell you at the end if you ask me, but I'm not going to tell you right now. <laughs> In any case, this, this, this black hole is putting out these powerful jets. These black holes, these ones that are at the centers of galaxies, are extremely important in terms of cosmology and setting the entire universe uh, into its present state. The structure of our universe. Remember, before the Big Bang and at the Big Bang, there was nothing in our present cosmology except maybe quantum fluctuations. And then suddenly everything appeared, but it was still very uniform. And somehow, when you look around today, you see stars and galaxies and us and everything else. How did all of that get, how did all of that happen? These black holes have an enormous amount to do with it. Even though their mass, even this one, is much, much less than the mass of the galaxy because they have such powerful gravity and because when matter falls toward them, it can be expelled like this. And these jets, actually sculpt galaxies and set the size that a galaxy can reach and affect the shape and, so, and the entire structure of the galaxy and clusters of galaxies. So these black holes are extremely important in formation uh, and the formation and structure of the universe. Now, we study these little black holes that are only 10 sun masses. And you might wonder, well, that's kind of piddly. I mean, you could study these, so why not study these? But the answer is that these don't do anything. They're so big, so far away. The event horizon around this black hole, it's huge. The event horizon, I think you might know, is that light trapping surface, you know, where you know, at the event horizon clock stop. And, and once you get to the event horizon, if you're the foolhardy astronaut, you only can go in. There's no other way. You can never go out. Light can't get out. That's why the hole is black. That's why it's called black. That event horizon there is about the size of the solar system. Whereas the black holes we study are, oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I want to I tell you, I want to show you this. And I, I missed it because this, this is another supermassive black hole. In fact, this isn't just some supermassive black hole. This is the one in the center of our galaxy right there. And these are orbits of stars around it that this woman, Andrea Getz, has been measuring for quite a few years. So this is a time lapse. This is about 10 years. And you can see these stars, some of them as they pass near the black hole. And this is a time, it just loops over and over. Some of these move at a few percent the speed of light as they go by this black hole. Our black hole is about 4 million sun masses. So it's a lot less than the other one. This is called Sagittarius A star. And these, again, this whole field here is only one arc second, one human hair it's at uh, 70 feet. So this is a tiny region. And just to give you a feeling of where science is going, this fellow here, who's a colleague of mine, Shep Dolman, right here at Smithsonian, 
is building an event horizon telescope, EHT. You could look it up on Wikipedia. The EHT is going to not only, it's going to image, it's going to image the black hole itself. It has a resolution of 50 millionths of an arc second. It's a, an array of radio telescopes across the Earth. And they're going to actually see material, and they're going to see light bending very strongly around the black hole. It's called the Event Horizon Telescope. Very exciting. They've already made a cut across it. And that, th so he's going to image that black hole. as an astonishing idea. Now, I'm sorry I'm out of I was out of order. I've come to our type of black holes. This is my uh, student from a long time, who's a postdoctoral fellow now. Um, so the kinds of black holes we study, so I told you a moment ago, or a little while ago, that there's tens of millions of stars that have been crushed into black holes in our Milky Way. But they're only tens of kilometers across. So the size of Manhattan Island, they're event horizon. So they're tiny, and they're black, and they're silent, and we don't see them. So of the tens of millions, we know 50. And the 50 we know have a star that's orbiting very close to them, so close that matter can be siphoned off by the black hole into this disk of rotating gas around the black hole. So this is gas being pulled off this star, ordinary star, and it comes into this disk. It doesn't fall straight over because there's angular momentum. The material goes into this disk, and over the period of, of about a month, the material spirals on in because there's friction between the gas atoms. And near the center, when the stuff is very near the black hole, about 10 or 20 kilometers from the black hole, the material is moving at almost the speed of light. And the friction between the gas atoms is so intense, just like rubbing your hands on a cold day, except if you could rub your hands at the speed of light, you can imagine how hot they get. So it, it gets really hot. It gets to be right down in a region the size of Rhode Island, just like 50 miles across or so. You have a region that's 10 million degrees which is the temperature at the center of the sun, not the surface, the center of the sun, 10 million degrees. And from that tiny region is pouring out x-rays because it's so hot it doesn't pour out light, it pours out x-rays. It pours out 100,000 times the power of our sun from a region the size of Rhode Island. 100,000 times the power. And you know, if you could go to Rhode Island and heat it up to 10 million degrees, it would be 100,000 times brighter than our sun. And I'm not recommending it. <laughs> But that's, you know, that's, that's, that's the secret here. And when there's too much matter coming in, some of it is expelled along the spin axis of the jet, as indicated here, just like the jet that I showed you earlier in Cygnus A. So these are very exciting. And what we've been doing is, for, the la for what I've been doing for my career, is measuring the two properties that can be measured, as I told you, how much the black holes weigh. So we've done that for 25 of them. And for 10 others, uh, 10, of, 10 of the same, actually, We've also measured how fast they're spinning. So we've measured the two fundamental properties of these black holes. And once we know those two fundamental properties, then we have a complete description. Can you imagine? I mean, just a complete description of a speck of dust. You need a trillion numbers to specify, more than a trillion numbers, to specify all the atoms and the arrangements and everything. Here, two numbers, and that's general relativity. That's just the way black holes are, according to theory. And that's what we're testing, the theory, to the extent that we can. So I want to now just give you a very brief, before I turn to the telescope, just to remind you what telescopes are. So this is a sort of interesting representation. I'm not going to describe it in detail. But here is now up here. So you might imagine that this is our galaxy, and maybe this is Andromeda over here or something like that. And as you go back in time, you look back into the universe. Telescopes are time machines. They let you look back and see how things were earlier. And people always say, oh, time machine, oh, this is so complicated or something. But, you know, it's not really complicated. Just think about it yourself. I mean, you know, light is only traveling. It takes, it takes from here to here, it takes light a billionth of a second to travel. And one nanosecond, it travels a foot, okay? That means that when you look at me, you know, from out there, that you're not seeing me as I am now. You're seeing a younger me. You know, no, I'm, I'm, I'm being serious now, by, by about, you know, 50 billionths of a second or so. You're, you're, being, you're, you're seeing a younger me. And, and you know how it is. If you shine a, a laser at the moon, it takes a second to get there. And you look at the sun, and you say, oh, it's really nice, you know. But the sun could be gone, and you won't know about it for nine minutes, because that's how long it takes the light to get to us. And right now, these people, we were just hearing about new horizons. Well, you know, they send a command out to the Pluto out there, 
and they have to wait five hours to see if it happened. Or no, 10 hours, five hours to get out and five hours to get back. So this is, and then, you know, it's years to get to the nearest star. And then, well, okay, so once you see that, then it's not hard to imagine how you can look back in time and see how the universe looked five or 10 billion years ago and all the way back to this last surface of last scattering where the universe was 400,000 years old. And we can't quite look back here, but we're almost, ha I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk any more about that because that's beyond. <laughs> I'm gonna turn to the telescope now. I'm turning to the telescope and the telescope is a major undertaking. It's at the limits of what technology and, and management and humanity can achieve, in my opinion. It's not like an aircraft carrier, a nuclear reactor or something. It's one of a kind, and it's pushing technology really to the limits in quite a few areas. And to build such a telescope, it's a billion dollar endeavor, you need consortium members. These were the angels, Korea and Australia. They put their money down first. They let us get the first mirror done. And then there's Brazil joined us recently, Sao Paulo actually, and then there's a number of universities, institutions in the United States, including here, the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory and Harvard University, which are two leads. And here's the location of the observatory in the Chilean Andes. So I was at my first board meeting and I was sitting there for about four hours and they were talking about finances and they were talking about politics at the national level. And my director had said, Jeff, why don't you be on this thing because you know about telescopes. When I got there, there was not a mention of a telescope. It was all about things I didn't have any idea what was going on, none, none at all. So after about three or four hours of this, uh, I, had, I, I walked out of the room for a, a break or something and I walked out, this is at Santa Barbara Street in Pasadena where the headquarters are. I walked out in the backyard and here are the mirrors drawn on this parking lot. And I suddenly saw that and, I, and I, it was like a wake up, you know, after being in that meeting. It was like to see that and to realize that you're going to make seven mirrors that size, you're going to make those seven mirrors work as though they were one mirror. The seven pieces have to work as one and they, all have to be perfect and in every sense, that entire 80 foot diameter thing, this 80 foot diameter thing, has to be perfect to one millionth of an inch. No, one thousandth of an inch machine shop, maybe one ten thousandth these days, I don't know, I haven't been one lately, but a millionth of an inch, 80 feet across? Okay, so this is what has to be achieved. And telescopes have two qualities, an extra one that, that Christine didn't mention, the bigger you make them, not only do you get a bigger light grasp and you can see fainter objects and study them, but in addition, the bigger the telescope, the sharper the image you can get, but only if you make the mirrors perfect. And by perfect, I mean they have to reach the diffraction limit, which is the theoretical limit that can be reached, and that is a huge challenge in this case. Here's a, here's a picture of one of these mirrors. Uh, and I'm going to show you a, a little film here that's uh, going to show you uh, how these mirrors, mirror blanks are made. So you can see the scale here. This guy's, and there's a face plate here. It's only about two inches thick. And down below, this, the mirror, you'll see. Let's see. Let's see what I've got here. I've got, a, uh, I've got a movie here. Right. No. Yes, I do. Is it going to start? Yes, it's going to start. That's great. Okay, this is an animation that went on for about a year where uh, one of these mirrors is cast. So one of these mirrors, segments. but this is the casting of the blank. This is not the grinding and polishing of the mirror. So this is a time-lapse pictures over the course of a year. And first they build a mold. And what they're heading toward is a big mold that they're gonna put blocks of glass, just like this block of glass, just like this one right here. They're gonna put blocks of glass in it, and then they're gonna heat the blocks of glass and they're gonna melt. Then they're gonna, just like my mercury dish on that pie, in that pie thing, they're gonna rotate this whole thing, this massive thing. So it'll give it a shape like this, just like if you rotate a bucket of water, it, water piles up on the sides of the bucket. So this is all the building of the mold and that's what's happening right there. So you can see is a lot of effort here, and it took a year, it was a year, and now these cores right here, these are where the glass is going to go, these are, bore, these are a refractory material, and the glass is going to leak down in the cracks between these to make a very thick honeycomb structure 
behind this two inch faceplate. And this will be the structure that will support the front faceplate. That big cover you just saw is the cover of this oven that's going to cover it when they heat it to 2,000 degrees and they rotate it. Here, they're putting the blocks of glass in. Again, it's just these blocks of glass. Then they're going to cover it up. And then they're going to rotate it at about 5 RPM. So it's, you remember 45 RPM records. This is about 5 RPM. Of course, this is about 50 feet across, not 6 inches across. <laughs> now here's the glass melting. See, at 2,000 degrees, melting down. And now you see the faceplate forming. And the glass is going. And then in the next shot, you're going to see it kind of from the side and you'll see the level of glass sink down. You'll see the level of glass sink down. There is another shot, I believe. <laughs> yes, here, see, you're looking for the side now. Now look, the glass is just starting to melt. Look at those marks there, like on a river or something. Now watch, as it flows down like honey, it's about the viscosity of honey, flows down in these cracks, you see, and then you see the faceplate. So this is actually the moment at which this, and then for about two months, they just continue to rotate it and let it cool and so forth, and let it anneal. And then in the end, they just lift it out. And I'm going to skip lifting it out. How do they heat it? They heat it with the big heaters, right? And those blocks on the side. Just big wire heaters. Oh, thank you. Um, so this is the genius, Roger Angel, who used to be an X-ray astronomer. I used to work with him, uh, who went to uh, doing optical astronomy. And he is inspecting the very first mirror we finished. So we finished one of these. We, finished one. we were in the desert for four years finishing it. Why are these hard? It isn't so obvious why they're hard, but let me try to tell you. The mirror in the middle is easy because it has an axis of symmetry. But these mirrors out on the outside have a very funny, unusual shape, and they're just pieces of what would be one big giant mirror. Now you might ask, why don't we make a mirror 25 meters in diameter? It's, it's like building that boat you can't get out of your basement. You couldn't get it to the mountain, okay? That, that's the reason, okay? These are the largest mirrors you can transport, right, safely. So that's why we have seven segments. That's the way why we do it. But these are really hard to make because they have a very strange shape. I won't go into details, but think of a Pringle or sh chip or something. I mean, it has an odd shape. And then you have to make that Pringle accurate to one millionth of an inch. So the testing of that and the polishing of that is a huge art. And this, this guy right here is the brains behind this entire thing. And I'll tell you this, if you go to Tucson, you really would be missing something if you don't go to the mirror lab. It's under the Wildcat Stadium, the football stadium at the University of Arizona. It's run by the University of Arizona. They have tours. It is some. This is the most challenging optic that has ever been built in the history of the world. So how good is it? Okay, so you might as well know how good it is. Here's Hubble. Now, what is, he, what is this? This is a picture of what's called a globular cluster. So there's about 120 of these in our galaxy. Shapley used them to figure out the center of our galaxy. They're balls of stars, about 100,000 stars that are orbiting each other. And there's about, um, like I say, 120 of them spherically distributed around the outside of our galaxy. And this is one. But it's not in our galaxy. This one's at 10 million light years. So Hubble can take a picture of it, and this is what it gives you. Not that satisfying. This is a simulation, of course, because we don't have the giant Magellan telescope yet. <laughs> but this is what the GMT will do. Images 10 times sharper than Hubble. I mean, Hubble is the gold standard for imaging, as, it, as everyone knows. So how is that possible? You see? These big mirrors aren't the secret, because those big mirrors alone would still give you a big, fuzzy star image because the atmosphere destroys the quality of the image. I mean, interesting like that uh, picture I showed you of the whole universe and now and, and Big Bang and so forth. I mean, photons coming from a quasar billions of light years away stream through the universe light particles stream through the universe without any interaction. They just come right to us, and everything is perfect. And what's called the wavefront is perfect, pristine, completely flat. And then it hits the atmosphere. And in a thousandth of a second, just like heat waves over a road or something, it has ripples in it. So you know, this big telescope would be a light bucket. It would not be a real precision instrument. It wouldn't be able to work at the diffraction limit without 
these magic mirrors. Now, what are these magic mirrors? So I told you I would show you what they are. Here is a picture of one. So this one right now is working at the, uh, at the Large Binocular Telescope in Arizona. So this mirror is as thin as this CD. It's made of glass, and it's a little over a meter across. So you say, how do you handle it? Well, carefully, obviously, but, <laughs> but seriously, it's floated magnetically. So what you see on it here, on the surface, are these little magnets. So these are, let's see if I can get this off here. Yeah. So these, these are not refrigerator magnets. These are your, your, your rare earth neodymium magnets. They're, they're very, very strong, see? And, and there's, there's a thousand of them on there. And those thousand little magnets sitting on this thin, thin glass membrane, each one of them, when it's in the telescope up here, has a voice coil near it, a little thing that can push on it magnetically. And so that floats the whole mirror. And these little voice coils, there's one for each of these, are controlled by a computer, but, well, that's interesting, the table's magnetic. Uh, <laughs> so so the, 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 the light, so when you're looking at an incredibly faint galaxy and you want a incredibly sharp image to do your best work, you take a bright star that's near your, uh, your uh, object that you're interested in, you take that bright star, and that light comes down into the telescope. Then there's an interferometer, called a shack hartman interferometer down below, that determines how... Uh-oh. Uh Uh-oh, <laughs> uh -oh, I did it now. Let's see if I can recover here. It's, it's got a... Um, it's got a... Uh, uh, the wave front and front here is all ripply. And so what happens is this shack hartman interferometer, a thousand times a second, measures how ripply the light is of that bright star that's passing in front of that big mirror. And that's determined down here below this hole. And that's determined, and, it, and then determining that, a computer sends signals to each one of these voice coils. And it makes this mirror shimmer just right to completely cancel out to 90% of perfection all of the effects of the atmospheric disturbances. And that's how you can get an image as sharp as though it were in space. And that's how you can reach the theoretical limit of these giant mirrors. So I call them magic because it just seems to me it isn't magic. It's what Arthur C. Clarke, I think one of his three axioms was, you know, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I mean, that's really what it amounts to. I mean, if Isaac Newton saw a GPS, what would he say? <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, I, I, this is, this is, so this is, this is very nice. It's so good I have to go back because I, I, I first want to say, I've looked through telescope eyepieces since I was a kid, but professionally for many, many years, and I still do. And when you, but if you look through an eyepiece and you look at a star, you'll see it dancing around at high magnification because of all the effects of the atmosphere. So this next picture shows you what I saw for forever until only the last few years, namely a big blurry star jumping around. And you have to work with it. You just have to put up with it. Except now, with these magic mirrors, you will see what, it, what they do. So here's a big fat star jumping around, and all of a sudden they'll turn on the magic mirror, and it's two stars, and that's how much sharper it is. And this is real data from the Large Binocular Telescope in Arizona. That's what it can do. And these two guys here, Phil Hens and uh, Laird Close, are the guys that really uh, put, made this happen. So this is a, uh, uh, a movie that gives you a feeling for uh, what it's like um, up there on the mountain. So over here, I didn't get to say it, are, are two six and a half meter telescopes where I've observed many, many times. And they were, those mirrors were made by the same process that I showed you. Now this telescope isn't really there, they painted it on, but this is really the Andes, okay? This is really the site. <laughs> they didn't paint this. And so this is at about 8,300 feet, and the Andes behind go up to about 20,000. So we're on the Pacific Ocean side, and the site is one of the very best sites. It, I'm going to say, for me, it is the best site in the world. The air is more stable. There's 300 nights a year that you can observe there, that's clear. Certainly that's not the case in Cambridge. Uh, <laughs> and, 
And here you see, here you see this grand telescope. The telescope weighs a thousand metric tons. Each mirror, the mirror itself, each mirror weighs 20 tons. And the whole thing weighs a thousand tons, the movable part. And, ye and here you see the mirror covers opening and you see this big structure around it. And it's, there's, there's an enormous amount of engineering that goes into this, a thousand tons, but think about it. You talk about how smooth it has to move, smoother than smooth. It's got to move so smooth on these big oil bearings here, you can't imagine how smooth, because if it quivers at all, you will have lost all the advantage of having produced these incredible optics. So it has to move, and thousand tons moving that smoothly. And it's, there, here's the instruments here. These are, there, these are the, there's different instruments for very faint objects, for bright objects. Some of them just take direct pictures. Some break the light into a spectrum, like a white light, sunlight going through a prism. So these are things, you can see how large they are by this guy here. And you go down into the bowels of this thing, and I think it goes down into where the computers are. And it's good to remind you the computers behind this. Without computers, nothing would have happened, right? You couldn't build these mirrors. You could never design this telescope. You could never analyze these data. You could never make these magic mirrors work. In fact, what could you do these days without computers? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> so here you are opening up late at night. By the way, the engineering is huge because you've got to make sure that this thing can stand earthquakes. You know that Chile has earthquakes. And so this thing for a Richter scale 6.5, we've engineered it so that you should be able to start the next night. At a seven, you might be down for a week or a month. At an eight, we need to survive. So it's all been engineered that this structure isn't going to just fall apart the next earthquake that happens, because this is gonna be operating for 50 years. I think you got the scale of it. They usually put a truck somewhere so you get a good. You see the lasers shooting off now, and I didn't even mention the lasers. So very often, there's a, ooh, another, another mirror cover thing. So I'll tell you what the lasers are, because they're fun. So the lasers, very often, you can't find a bright star near your faint object. There just aren't any. And you've got to have the bright star within 10 arc seconds. That's 10 hairs at 70 feet. So you've got to have it pretty close. So sometimes you don't have a bright star. So what is done is you shoot a yellow laser up that is tuned to the sodium atoms that are at the upper ionosphere, 100 kilometers up. And those in there and there, you excite those sodium atoms and they radiate like a star, like an artificial star, 100 kilometers away. And you have that very close to the object you're interested in. And it's that signal that allows you then to use the Shack Hartman and to use these magic mirrors to actually get the control signal. You need a bright object and you make it artificially. Ah, here it is. So I just finished observing, okay. So I showed you the small instruments, now I'll show you the biggest instrument, one that Christine mentioned actually, and it's being built here. And this is the first first light instrument for the telescope, and it's called G-Clef. And I don't remember what, and he, because he, he likes music or something. But the LEF actually stands for Large Earth Finder. So this is a spectrograph. And of course, what's a spectrograph? Everybody kind of says, well, this is complicated or something. Really, a spectrograph, you know, you, you know what sunlight going through a prism does. It breaks the light up. Well, a spectrograph has a disperser, a prism. And then it's, it's, it's got a lens because the light coming through the telescope is coming to a focus. You want to make that go into a parallel beam before it hits the prism. And then after that, you need another lens so that you can bring the light back together and put it on a CCD, just like in your iPhone. So it doesn't, ha but of course, it gets to be a big deal. So this spectrograph is bigger than a, a very big gravel truck and weighs 10,000 pounds. And it's in a box that keeps it all at a 10th of a degree because this spectrograph has many purposes for investigating the very earliest stars, and for many investigations of quasars and so forth. But large Earth finder. So this is the third way to find planets. And that is their tug on the star that they're with. So a planet pulls on a star. So think, think of the Earth. Think, think of the Earth. There's the Earth and the Sun. Well, 
the Earth's going around the center of mass, really. It's not going right around the sun, but it's almost going directly around the sun. But the sun is also making a little circle because the Earth is tugging on it. The circle that the Earth makes is 93 million miles in radius. But the circle that the sun makes, because it's so much more, so much more massive, is only 100 miles in radius. So it hardly moves at all. And the Earth is moving at 30 kilometers per second, and the sun's only moving at about 10 centimeters a second. OK, an analogy is like, I can see some people aren't getting this, and I can believe that. So I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like a teeter-totter, right? You've got a very, very, like that person in the Guinness Book of World Records, 700 pounds on one end, and he's just barely flexing his stomach. And there's a little kid on the other end, and he's going whack, whack, whack. Well, that's the Earth, you know? And the guy sitting here that's weighing 700 pounds is, is just, you know, doing nothing. Right? <laughs> He's hardly moving on. That's the same, same idea. So this instrument is designed to measure velocities of stars of 10 centimeters a second. That's about the speed of a garden snail. So can you imagine a star a million miles in diameter and it's moving 10 centimeters a second once a year, say, as the Earth goes around it, and you're going to measure that? Wow. So that's what that instrument is doing. Now, I always want to remind people, and that was, by the way, that's Andy St. Georgie. He's the person that's the principal investigator of this instrument. And I always want to remind people it's people that do this, and it's people with full commitment, I mean, beyond whatever you can imagine sometimes. And this is Wendy Friedman. She's a, a, a head of the Carnegie Observatories and the chair of the GMT board. And this is uh, Pat McCarthy, who sent me these nice movies. He's the director of the GMT. So I'll finish now because I realize I'm at the end. And so here's a picture, I'm in, end of time, I mean. And, and I, could, I could go on for hours, really. <laughs> but, and, and this is a picture of, 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 the, of the telescope on its site. Now, you, you're going to ask the question, aren't you? Why is there all this land over here, right? Is it a baseball diamond? You know, is it, is it a, a set of tennis courts? No. So when we were in a board meeting, this was about two years ago, when we were, before we flattened the mountain, it's flattened now, we decided, are we going to, or we had a decision, are we going to have one telescope and a small, just flatten the mountain down a little bit? Or are we going to flatten it a lot and make a lot of room over here? And we want to make this room because in, and it cost us $2 million, and we almost didn't do it. It was a big decision because we didn't have the $2 million. <laughs> but this is so that we can build a second GMT 20 or 30 years from now. And the two working together will work like one telescope as an interferometer, and they will make images 100 times sharper than Hubble, not 10 times sharper than Hubble. Okay. But we need another billion dollars. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I stop. And with that, very dynamic presentation. Let's open it up to questions from the floor. Yes, right back there. How are the mirrors going to get transported from Arizona to Chile? So there's, you go on a ship down to Valparaiso, and then they get trucked. And when they're trucked, they're in a big case and in their mirror mount, and uh, they're insured. And, uh, <laughs> and they're, they're shipped horizontally, and of course you've got to own the roadway, so you have to have the Chilean police and everything ahead of you. And then there are places where there's real problems with clearance and so forth, but mirrors of this size have already been transported to distant sites in Hawaii and Chile and other places. So 8.4 meters, yes, say 25 meters, absolutely no, <laughs> probably 10 meters, no. Yes, sir. On the engineering, I'm just kind of curious. Um, how was the mirror cradle um, made independent of the thermal expansion of the housing? So there's, there's, there's a lot to that. Each of these mirrors is very thick, as you saw. There's a two-inch faceplate on the front. And then there's this borosilicate honeycomb structure behind. It's mostly hollow. All those. Uh, uh, refractory blocks are cut out of there and everything. And behind there are a bunch of little pushers that can push on the mirror. So that's how it keeps them really good in terms of, like as a telescope steers over, these things flex. 
But these little pushers behind, there's 300 of them on each mirror, push on them just right to keep out the spherical aberration and chromatic aberration and other aberrations that perhaps you know about. And then also there is, I think maybe also to your question, air conditioning in every one of them to keep the temperature of that front. So every one of those holes in the back has air blowing into it to keep the temperature of that front faceplate to within a half a degree of the ambient temperature outside so that we don't get heat waves coming up off the mirror. Can you imagine the amount of engineering yeah. of all that? Yeah. <laughs> sure do. Yes, right over there. Um, is the uh, GMT going to compare to the James Webb Space Telescope? Um, yes, I can make a comparison. So the James Webb Space Telescope, which cost $8 billion and will be launched uh, hopefully before this, uh, and is a six and a half meter telescope. This is a 24 and a half meter. So the light collecting power here is hugely greater. The James Webb cannot work beyond the diffraction limit because that's the theoretical limit set by physics. So in that sense, it's no better than this, but it has two great advantages. Being above the atmosphere, in, in the infrared, it, it doesn't have, uh, the upper atmosphere produces a lot of infrared background, which this telescope is subject to, but that telescope will not be subject to. That's its greatest advantage, so that it can go much fainter, uh, on much fainter objects, simply because the background light from the upper atmosphere is not hindering it. That's its biggest virtue. The young gentleman right up front. I thought the um, black holes were combined by the antimatter inside the black holes, combining with the matter outside, making huge explosions, which send off the heat, heat waves. No, nope, nothing comes from inside the event horizon. No, nope, absolutely not. Matter and antimatter really don't have anything to do with it, in fact. What, you know, what, you can ask yourself really hard, what happened? You know, what happened? to a billion sun masses, that it all ends up in a point that you can't see because there's a vent horizon around it. You can't even see it. And nothing can come out. So there's no energy coming from there. All the energy that I was talking about is coming from outside the event horizon. And it's due to the material hurtling toward the black hole at the speed of light, being accelerated in trillion g gravity, and then just smashing and producing these jets that I've showed you in this picture. Do we have any questions up the mouth? All right. the, the woman in the third row. I was just going to say, is there any capacity for harm harnessing this level of light and bouncing it hither and yon? I mean, is there a potential downside of disrupting this expanding universe with bigger and bigger <laughs> machines? Wait a minute. Machines? You're, you're talking about this machine? Uh, the, the devices such as that. You mean this yeah. telescope? No, the telescope is a passive device. It really is kind of like when you go to Grand Canyon and you have your iPhone and you just take pictures of the Grand Canyon and stuff. You're not hurting the Grand Canyon. We're just basically <laughs> looking at the universe and collecting the information that comes to us <clears throat> passively. It's whatever, it's the same photons that are striking us outside when we're walking around and stuff, except we're just collecting them incredibly sensitively, exquisitely sensitively, and it's really not at all damaging anything. <laughs> Although it does flatten the top of the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take two more questions, and i got to go with the young lady right over here for the first one. Um, how do you clean the mirrors? Wow. <laughs> wow. 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 Not Windex. <laughs> So I've actually cleaned mirrors myself, and in the old days, we, you know, an, an eight meter mirror, I helped clean it. We put booties on it, we got up on it, and we actually scrubbed the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, we, we cleaned it off, you know. We, you know I, 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 don't think, I don't think we actually walked on it, that's a little wrong. But we scrubbed it, we scrubbed it. And you know, the aluminum coating on it is very tough. I didn't say this, but the glass has a very thin aluminum coating on the front surface. Aluminum is the, is the reflector that's generally used. And it's very tough, and you can clean it. But one thing that happens is about every five, let's see, is it, well, I don't know how often they're going to do it here. I think, yes, every, every, about every year, they're going to re-aluminize one of these. They're going to put a new aluminum coating on it. So how do they do that? Because it takes a lot of time. What we're doing is we're 
buying an extra mirror, an extra 20-ton mirror, and we're keeping it freshly illuminated. We have it freshly illuminized. And then we take out the dirty one here and then put back the clean one. So we have a spare, in other words. That we, and that, so that, that's, when we, that's when we really want to clean it. We want a new aluminum coating. But otherwise, you wash them in between. And you can also wash them with dry ice, with like a fire extinguisher. Well, there's a couple of techniques. It's, it's kind of hairy, though. <laughs> I did not know you were going to have a spare. <laughs> we are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right, last question, straight in the back. Um, I had a question about the magic uh, mirror. Yeah. So the question is about the impact of adjusting that light and correcting that light before it even gets to instruments, as opposed to, I mean, it seemed like there was a lot of software machinations going on in some of those earlier um, captures. So as opposed to, say, using a computer control to correct that light in its raw form to, to recapture those images, does that make any sense? Well, let's see. I mean, I mean I'm not sure <laughs> if, I got, if I got it exactly right. I mean, what is happening is that the wavefront is terribly disturbed here as it hits these big mirrors. But then these mirrors completely cancel that out by having this bright star being analyzed down below a thousand times a second and sending the signals up to all these little magnets up here and then just causing this thing to shimmer just right. And so the light that actually gets to the instruments, which is, I think, what you're talking about, when, when it gets to them, it's as though this telescope were in space. You've completely taken out the effects of the atmosphere right here. And with the computers and interferometer and computations down here. But that system is completely cleaning the wavefront. And by the time it gets to the instruments, the instruments don't know the difference whether this whole telescope is in space or it's on the ground. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. I guess the question is whether that correction is done before it gets the, I mean, you're essentially making a software correction yes. before you even get to the instrument. It's really a hardware correction, if you don't mind, because yeah. these mirrors are actually hardware, and they're rippling. And they are, of course, under software control at a 1,000 times a second. So that's how fast you've got to do it, because the atmosphere scintillates that fast. We've all seen stars flicker you know, on a bad day. You know, and they really flicker when you look at them with a big telescope. Well, you saw that star image jump around, that red image that I was showing you. And that's what you're taking out. In fact, that image, that, that really showed what it was. You have this big ball jumping around because the atmosphere over this big eight meter mirror has all this uncertainty because of the atmosphere. And then you turn on these magic mirrors, and you saw that thing collapse to two little stars. That's the magic. Okay, thank you. And with that, we are going to conclude tonight's Observatory Night webcast. Thank you for joining us, and I hope that you'll join us again next month. <laughs>